you need to have mTOR. You need it for your muscles. You need it for your brain growth. Here, just to put a finer point on it, this was an experiment, and there are several such, where they took gerbils and gave them rapamycin to continuously inhibit mTOR, and they actually couldn't form long-term memories. You, you don't want that, because you need the protein synthesis to make those synapses that make the memories form. I really like this graphic. I stole it from Keir Watson from, and, and Afifa Hamilton, who have this great blog called Rosemary Cottage Clinic. And in this blog post, they were talking about how pre-agriculture, we would naturally probably have these feasting and fasting modes. And they talk about how if you're stuck in the feasting mode all the time, you can end up with problems of diseases of civilization. And then if you don't have enough food, you end up resorting to eating plants that are bitter. And the, if you're stuck there for a long time, then you're going to end up with toxicity and malnutrition and maybe even starvation. How long does it take you to get into the energy mode? If you're on a high-carb plant-based diet, it's going to take you three to four days to really get there. If you're on a low-carb, even if you're meat-based, you're already keto adapted. I, I would suggest that it takes less than a full day of not eating before you're already in this mode that it takes three days to get to from a high carb diet. I'll just show a diagram, uh, a real old diagram from Cahill where he's talking about the different modes of eating. And so you've just eaten and now you've got uh, these different phases you have to go through before you can get to the energy phase. So there's the absorptive phase where you're actually dealing with all the glucose that you just ate. And it's not until that's over that you can start working on the post-absorptive phase where you're depleting your glycogen. And then you finally get to the energy mode and start being able to get benefits. I would suggest that if you're eating a, a low-carb even if it's a high meat diet, the space of time between getting there, even though I don't have a quantitative value for you, has got to be shorter. If you're necessarily going to eat a diet that's low in essential proteins, um, that could be a sustainability problem. I didn't have a chance to talk about meat-based bioactives. What I mean by that are just conditionally essential nutrients like taurine and carnitine and carnosine, which uh, we don't pay much attention to because we're able to synthesize them ourselves but the amount that we need is probably more than that rate that we do synthesize them. Evolutionarily, we're probably made to expect to get some of that from our food. Are we sufficiently going to get into the growth mode? Well, this is where I think the, the advantages and disadvantages really stand out because if you're, eating, if you're constantly eating a, a diet that's low in essential proteins, uh, you're going to risk that sarcopenia and, and brain compromise. Whereas if you're eating a low-carb meat-based diet, you're frequently going to get into that growth phase. If we're talking about longevity, if this whole thing is about longevity, what do we know about longevity? This is just an association, but I think there's actually something to it. Your body composition matters. Muscle mass probably matters for uh, how likely you are to live a long life. 